Hi friends, hope everybody's doing well. Happy Thursday. Um, it is a hot, stinking hot <laughs> week here in Northwest Arkansas. We are roasting, but my garden is growing and I've got lots of tomatoes coming ripe. Um, I've got some peppers coming on. We picked a couple of cucumbers. All of my herbs are doing well. So um, although I am a cold weather girl, I think that the only plus of this hot weather is that my garden is doing pretty good. <laughs> so um, hope you're all doing well and trying to stay cool. So today we are going to be in the book of Matthew, um, beginning in chapter 4 and going into part of chapter 5. So let's just get right into that. Um, Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went out through all Syria, and they brought him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him, from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that was... Um, chapter 4 verse 18 through chapter 5 verse 16. So we start out pretty much where we left off last time. Jesus is still in the area of Galilee where he grew up and ministering there um, shocking and irritating the people in turns. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of take this one verse by verse today. So verse 18 starts out and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So the first question that I've asked myself reading this is, why was Simon called Peter? Okay, so we know um, later on by reading chapter 16 that Jesus actually gives him the name Peter. Um, but why would that be a thing? Okay, because we find other people in here, you know, like John Mark, some other people who have taken on these two names. Why are they taking on these two names? Well, during this time, the Greeks had conquered um, in, oh, I don't know what, three, 300, 330 BC. So they had, you know, of course, brought all their Greek culture there with them. And then when the Romans conquered, they kind of came in and, uh, and assimilated as well. And so you have like this, um, this Greek and Roman sort of culture going on. Well, one of the things that um, they were called Hellenists. So anybody who took on this Hellenistic um, Greek culture was called a Hellenist. And so that was kind of a thing to, um, I don't know if it was just like a trend or what they were doing, but they were taking on their Jewish name and then their Greek name. And so um, that's why you find several of these New Testament um, Jewish guys with two names. Um, but Simon, he was renamed Peter by Jesus for a very specific reason. So in chapter 16, um, I'm going to read that to you. 
Um, in verse 13, Jesus um, and his disciples are hanging out in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus says to the disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, um, at the time, who was just called Simon, speaks up and says, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, I did not have to reveal that to you. It's the Spirit inside you um, that revealed that to you. Um, but I say that you are Peter, and um, because Peter meant rock, and, and he says, on this rock I will build my church. And so what he's basically meaning is, is on that confession of faith, um, on that confession of belief in Messiah, and the confession that he is um, the king, and that it is only through him that we find salvation, he is the son of the living God, through that confession, that is the rock, um, the foundation on which his church is built. And so Peter, being the first to confess that, um, received that name, Rock. And it's kind of like if you imagine, you know, a foundation stone, him being the first foundation stone by being the first confessor um, that, that Christ is, you know, who he is, who he says he is, that Yeshua was the Messiah they were waiting for. And then all of the rest of us confessors um, have built upon that, right, and building that church. So that's pretty cool. So in verses 18 through 22, we see these guys, um, you know, just being called, hey, follow me. And they're like, oh, sure, <laughs> I'll leave my fishing net, I'll leave my father, I'm just going to follow you. Um, so what compelled them to do that, right? They didn't know this guy. Um, they may not have even heard of him. Um, if they had heard things, they may not have heard all good things, right? Because there were people, some who were very, you know, okay with what uh, Yeshua was doing and some that were very, um, had a real problem with him getting up there and declaring himself as God, right? And so... Um, they, but they were compelled by the Holy Spirit to follow him, right? Just as we are today, um, something compels us um, and speaks to our spirit and says, you know, this is right. And that is why we choose to follow him. So verses 23 through 25 really kind of sum up a lot of, de of details, right? Um, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel, healing people. Uh, his fame went out through all Syria. They brought him sick people, diseased, tormented, demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics. He healed them. Great multitudes followed him from all over these places. Um, so it just really sums things up a lot. Um, Matthew chose not to focus on the details of this ministry during this time anyway. And there's a couple reasons that could be. It could be the, the people he was writing to already know. You know, maybe, maybe this is just very well known by the time Matthew's writing all this down. And so the people are aware of, of Jesus' faith. Fame. They have heard all of all of his deeds. Maybe he doesn't feel compelled to really write that down here. Um, but there are other places in the Gospels that do talk about um, this time of his ministry in better detail. So places uh, like Mark 1 through 6 or Luke 4 through 8, you can get some of the details about this time during Jesus's ministry. Um, and then also I wanted to remind you guys, so here in verse 25, it's talking about uh, places where people followed him, right? From Galilee, which is where he is at currently, um, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So again, remember that in the back of your Bible, there are probably maps, um, and you can go on, go back there and look on the map and see, you know, where these places were, right? So if Galilee is up here, up here at the top, can you see my map okay? Anyway, on my map, Galilee is up here at the top, and then we have Samaria, Decapolis, Judea, um, all of these places to the south, right? So basically, um, Galilee and every place down south, all these, you know, areas, people were coming up here to, um, to follow him and learn about him. His fame was spreading all throughout um, the, uh, the many other regions and the whole area. So moving into chapter 5, in verse 1, it mentions that his uh, he saw a multitude of people, and so he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, um, judging just by the context of this, it probably means all the people that were um, learning from him, not, his, not necessarily his 12 disciples or however many he had at the specific time. Um, it's all the disciples, right? Everybody who was following him and learning from him. So just as we are disciples today, it was a great multitude of disciples and they all came, sat down to listen to what he had to say. So this next part here, starting with verse uh, three, right? Um, yeah, this, um, 
is the beginning of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so it's a really famous portion of scripture. It's a famous, very famous time when Jesus um, taught the people. And um, the cool thing about this Sermon on the Mount is it's basically a clarification of Torah. Um, it's, you know, those, there are those who will want to say that Torah was done away with in New Testament, but no, not at all. Um, it was clarified and, and made more um, made more real and, and made more, uh, Yeshua was able to help the people understand what it meant better. Um, so it, the Sermon on the Mount, a clarification of the Torah, um, you know, he was trying to show these people it's not an external change, you know, this whole uh, being a righteous person. It's not what you do and the acts that you do um, in order to keep all the commandments in obedience. It's what goes on inside your heart and the internal change that you make inside. Then you obey the commands because you want to be obedient because you love God and you want to show him your love for him by um, obeying him. You know, if you know and understand his instructions, well then you want to follow them out so you can show how much you love him. Um, so that's why Yeshua is trying to teach the people here are um, ways that you can practice, you know, apply this practically to your life, right? Um, so the religious leaders of this time were burdening the people with all of these, you know, five steps to holiness sort of a thing. And they were, they were twisting the scriptures. They were twisting what um, the, the Torah and the prophets were saying in order to maybe, you know, have their thumb on the people or, um, you know, and some of them may have had good intentions. So they not, weren't all evil, probably. They probably thought they were doing right, but they were, they were twisting and they were adding a heavy burden. And so, um, you know, Yeshua was just trying to show them if you will let your heart be changed, you won't have to worry about if you're following these correctly because you will want to know what the instructions are and then you'll want to walk them out. So regarding the Beatitudes, like I was saying in an earlier video about the list of genealogies, sometimes we tend to skip through this, kind of rush through it because it's a repeating thing, right? Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. Um, and so we um, we kind of want a story, right? And we get a little distracted by the the repeat, the repetitiveness of the um, of things that are written in this way. But let's just go ahead and go through these one by one. Um, I can remember different um, sermons, different pastors along the way have called them the B attitudes. So ways that we are supposed to be, right? Attitudes that we should be taking on, the B attitudes. Um, but I wanted to show you guys, my first introduction to the B attitudes was in this little um, children's Bible that my mom, my parents probably um, together gave me this when it says when I was age two. So obviously I don't remember actually receiving this or who I received it from, but it's a really special Bible to me. I have little things put in all throughout. Um, there's a letter from my dad in here. There's a little, just little cards and things that I had. And my mom will recognize this. It's a little bookmark with a butterfly that has special meaning to us. Um, anyway, this is my little child's Bible. I pulled it out the other day. Oh, my mom will recognize this too. This is the bookmark that we got out the night before um, my son Michael was born. So, okay, anyway, I'm reminiscing, <laughs> but um, I wanted to show you guys my little pretty, they, they have this pretty page in the back where it has the Ten Commandments written out and then it has the Beatitudes. Oh, it's so pretty. And so I can remember as a little girl coming back here and I you know I thought that that was a super special part of the Bible because it was on this had this pretty lettering around it and, and design and, and of course the commandments so anyway I've had fun kind of flipping through this it is like King Jamesy to the max like it's it's King James but then there's all of these like um pronunciation marks on every Hebrew or just foreign word even on Egypt it tells you how to pronounce Egypt every single time Egypt is written so I'm not really sure what's up with that but um, it's very complicated oh it's a self-pronouncing edition so <laughs> of the new of the King James Bible all right anyway getting off track um anyway I wanted to show you that pretty part from the Beatitudes and my first introduction to the Beatitudes 
All right, so let's get into these. So the very first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So poor in spirit, this isn't actually referring to, you know, like finances. <laughs> it's referring more to um, our, maybe our character, um, our, um, our humility, our level of humility, okay? So someone who is poor in spirit is humble, and it's the opposite of being, you know, very self-reliant or sort of a self-made man or self-made woman. Um, when we are poor and spirit, um, we recognize that there is nothing that we can do to gain the kingdom. We're, we're not going to get in by our own merit, right? By our own goodness or our own, you know, how much we gave to the church that, or how much, you know, how many Sunday school classes we taught or whatever. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, and so that, that poor in spirit is just that walking in humility helps. Um, that was what will gain us the kingdom because we know that it is a gift from a generous God. Verse four, um, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. So, um, you know, there's a couple of different kinds of mourning that we can think about when we read this one. So there can be the mourning that comes from the sinful state of earthly life, right? Just the things that happen on the earth that are the result of sin. So, so death, pain, sickness, disease, hurt, um, you know, fighting, those sorts of things, war. Um, he provides comfort for us during those times. Uh, someday he will provide a permanent state of comfort, right? When he um, it rules and we no longer will mourn for the hurt of this world because it will no longer be here anymore and he will be the ruler of all. So he will bring in eternal comfort at that point. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So a lot of times when people hear the word meek, they think weak. Uh, meek doesn't mean weak. <laughs> uh, it means gentle. So blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, so, you know, the people who are meek and gentle, they don't try to take things by force. Um, they don't try to manipulate. Um, we don't need to take the earth or anything else by manipulation or by brute force. He provides for us daily all of our needs. Um, and one day he will provide for us permanently, right? We must be brave and courageous because sometimes it's hard to keep that gentle spirit. Um, we must have faith that God will do what needs to be done in his time. Um, and our faith will allow us an eternal inheritance with him and we will inherit the earth if we can keep this gentle spirit um, and let God exact judgment where he chooses to in his time. Um, a friend talks about how, you know, he's very careful about maybe, um, you know, punishing or judging his um, fellow man, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, if something goes wrong and he goes and, you know, cusses him out or tries to exact some kind of judgment or discipline upon this person because um, sometimes he's taking away what God would um, do and sometimes what God wants to do is a, a little harsher, but it makes, you know, it's a permanent message. Um, and so we need to just have faith that God will do all that needs to be done in his timing. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So I kind of feel like I'm currently in this place. I want to be as holy and as obedient as I can be because I love him. Um, and sometimes this can get, um, I don't know, kind of irritating to the people around me maybe. Um, so I'm kind of in this place right now where I don't want to be um, self-righteous. I don't want to have this sort of pious, holier-than-thou sort of attitude, but I just feel like I'm like just living, moving, and breathing everything that the that the Lord would want to show me at this time. So I do feel like I am currently hungering and thirsting to be more righteous um, and to realize what it really means to be holy and obedient to Him. So I am really thankful for that. He's responding to that um, hunger that I have. And so I just hope that I'm balancing it well with not being like a complete nutcase and making my family just want to run away. All right, verse seven, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Um, we will be shown mercy 
um, when we treat others with mercy. Um, I have just found that to be the case, um, at least in my own life. I really feel like God um, teaches me lessons by kind of making me suffer some of the things that I make other people suffer. So, you know, if I, if I treat someone badly, a lot of times it really is legitimately what goes around comes around for me anyway. And I do find I, I need to be so careful to treat people well, um, partially because that's just the right thing to do, but also because um, I tend to get uh, it back if I don't. We, we truly do reap what we sow. All right, verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Um, you know, later, yes, we will see God when, when someday it's time for us to meet him, but we will see him now. Um, and just when I think about this, being pure in heart, um, it's really difficult to, um, live in an impure way, an impure lifestyle, or have impure thoughts, or watch impure things, or do impure things, and still expect God to be there with you, right? Um, if we want to see God moving in our life and working in our life, if we want to have His presence with us, we need to be very careful that we're keeping our lives pure. Um, and everybody has different convictions and standards on what that is, but we just need to make sure that we know what the Word says and, you know, what it's instructing us to do as far as that goes. But we need to think about what our motives are. You know, when I try to manipulate things, I can't see God moving. Um, I only see the things that I forced to happen. So I need to be very careful that my motives are pure also, that the reason for doing things are because I truly want to be close to God to see him move in my life and not just because I want some kind of a you know, holy experience that um, it gives me a funny, fluffy feeling. <laughs> All right, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So a peacemaker helps to reconcile two opposing parties, right? If you have a couple of people that are fighting all the time, you have someone come in and mediate, that would be your peacemaker. And that's what um, Yeshua has done for us, right? Our Messiah has come in and reconciled us to God. So where we had disobeyed him and we had um, gone against his instructions to us. Yeshua has come in and stood in that place for us to uh, make peace between us. Um, we had broken God's law and broken the covenant that we had agreed to. Um, way back at Sinai, the people were given the instructions, they were given the Torah, and they made a covenant uh, with marriage language. They said, we will do everything that is, you know, that you have told us. And they said, we will. That is what you say when you're going to get married, right? So they had made a covenant. Um, and since then, that covenant has been broken over and over again. And we have stepped away from his instructions and we have broken his Torah law, um, give it, given to us. And so, you know, we have basically divorced him. Um, but the thing is, when you're reading in Torah about divorce, um, there has to be a death for a marriage covenant to actually be broken. So um, someone must actually die in order for there to no longer be a valid marriage anymore. Um, and then the bride can remarry. And so Jesus did that, right? If you're wondering, why did Jesus have to die? Well, he had to die so that the marriage covenant could be completely annulled and a new covenant could be made. So when he did that, um, now we can have a new covenant, right? And so way back, I think it was in, oh, it might have been the very first Matthew video I did. I talked about Ketuba, which is that time of engagement. I think it was the first one because we talked about um, how uh, Joseph and Mary were not yet uh, married, but they were in Ketubah. They were in an engagement period. And then I talked about how we are in Ketubah right now, too. We are waiting for our bridegroom to come, right? We are waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that is when we will make a new covenant with Him. Many people think we are in a new covenant right now, but we are not. We are waiting for Him to come and make that new covenant with us. Um, and so, anyway, all that to say <laughs> that Jesus became a peacemaker to us when He died and he made a way for this new marriage to take place. Um, we must find all ways also to help people, you know, in our sphere of influence and help opposing parties to find peace, especially between brothers, especially between those who are in the body. 
um, if we can come in and help resolve issues and arguments and things, well then we are building up the body and um, helping one another in a way that follows the word, right? Where we're all under the same standard of living. All right, so now we move into verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, you know, and we are seeing that today, and we're going to see it a lot more. I don't know if you guys have been following what's going on in Canada, but there are many pastors and other people involved in the ministry that are being jailed and being fined and being persecuted, and their churches are being locked up, and they had drone a drone flying over to... Um, find a group of people that were meeting outside because their church had been locked up and then the pastor was arrested out of that group. It's insane over there. Um, this guy that was arrested um, on his papers, it says he was arrested for inciting people to go to church. That's kind of a shocker. Um, but this is exactly what's going on in these days. We are being persecuted. Um, you know, we know that our faith is under attack. We know that in our, um, you know, in our political sphere or just, you know, in the media, wherever, um, in the general culture of America, people of faith are under attack, which seems really crazy because don't you know a whole lot of people of faith? <laughs> and not just in the circle you run with, right? Um, there is a lot of people of faith in America. And there is a lot of people who are um, of a conservative mindset, a lot more than uh, leaders would, or representatives <laughs> would want to make you believe. Um, and so that's just kind of, you know, just a little thing. I think we're being persecuted, but it's not because we're in the minority. It's kind of like Pharaoh, you know, when he wanted to get the Israelites under his thumb because there were so many of them and he knew that if he didn't subdue them and force him into a life of slavery that they would overtake and overtake his kingdom and, um, and overthrow his rule. So I just kind of feel like that's kind of what's going on in America. I don't think that the majority of Americans, um, are going along with some of the things our government government is pushing on us right now and persecuting us about but i think that the narrative is to make us believe that and so that we will think that we are weak but we are not weak um but whether we are or not uh, blessed are we who are persecuted for our righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven if you're going to be persecuted for anything make sure you're being persecuted for the right things and being persecuted because you are trying to live a righteous life um verse 11 blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So there's nothing new under the sun. The prophets were persecuted. We are persecuted. Um, that should not stop us. We just need to keep speaking. Um, I actually, I think my video last week was shadow banned for several days um, because I wanted to talk about Nephilim aliens and angels. And I put that in the title of our last Genesis teaching. And... Um, I had no views for quite a while on that one. It still has pretty low views. Um, and I think that, you know, they are trying to silence us, but I'm just going to keep talking and you need to keep talking and sharing and being who you are. Um, you know, you don't have a muzzle on you yet. So we just need to keep going um, and be glad that we have the opportunity to suffer in his name. Um, nothing that I have ever gone through is even comes close to suffering in his name, but that doesn't mean that that won't happen in the future. And so I guess I'm just kind of practicing now and, and being bold and making sure that I'm regularly ministering um, so that if that time ever does come that I have been um, practicing and I have been building up that um, ability and boldness and um, routine, right? That's a part of my life. All right, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So we are the salt of the earth, right? If you don't salt something, it doesn't taste very good. It's kind of bland and boring. So we are to be the thing that brings this, that brings out the goodness, right? Brings out the flavor, brings the spice to life. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking as I was reading this, and it doesn't necessarily apply to this specific uh, verse, but it is still a very cool concept. It's something a friend mentioned during our fellowship study a couple of weeks ago, and that's the salt covenant. So if you 
you go back to Numbers 18, 19, um, God says he will make a covenant of salt with the people. And so I was like, what does that mean? Well, a salt covenant is a friendship covenant. And so basically um, what you would do is like, say you'd go over to your friend's house, you'd bring a little bit of your salt with you, and then she would pull out her salt and you would mix your salt together in a little bowl, right? And then you would each take some of the salt and take it back home and mix it in with your salt. And so the idea was that, you know, you can't separate those little grains of salt back out again. And so now that our salt has been mixed together, then we are uh, forever friends and can't be separated. And so that is what God was saying there in Numbers 18 about making a salt covenant with us. It can't be undone. It can't be pulled back apart again. Um, so I think that was so sweet. I think I'm going to start bringing salt over to my friend's house when I come to visit. <laughs> All right, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. Um, and it talks about letting your light shine before men. So we can all be this. We can all be this light to the world, right? And um, we're in a dark, dark place where dark things are happening. And people are very depressed. And different parts of the nation are suffering with this more than others. Um, I'm very blessed to... I don't know if I live in a really easy state or if I'm just bucking every mandate and rule they try to put on me, but I don't feel at all that I've been, um, you know, persecuted or under any kind of a um, strict regulation or anything like that. Um, and so I think part of it's just really me um, <laughs> completely ignoring everything they put out there and tell us to do. But um, I do feel like I'm in a place that is really positive and people around me are really positive and we try to be lights to one another and so when I am out away from my you know normal fellowship group of people I try to be a light I try to look people in the eye and smile at them and and say hello and you know give them a uh, I don't know, just bring a sense of comfort and peace to people. So many people are afraid and, and so many people are have so many intellectual questions and so I really want to be um, this light of um, peace and hope. Um, so I don't know if I'm doing that well or if people take it as sarcasm, but I'm trying. Um, but you know, we can all be this light by the way that we act daily. It, um, it all starts first in the way that we treat people in our character and in our integrity. And then secondly, we should look for opportunities to be a light to people, you know, so maybe just do an extra thing, um, offer, you know, a ride for someone, offer to go out and pick up somebody's groceries, or maybe to let their kids come and play or whatever. Um, look for opportunities to be that light. If you're stuck at home, be an online influence. Um, I have talked about my Facebook deal. So, you know, I, I got a Facebook for a little bit and then I came back with just a different mindset and a mindset of, um, that I wanted to be positive and that I didn't want to engage in political things, not because I don't care, because I do care and I do have a strong opinion regarding um, political things, but just that it's not, in many cases, it's not a salvation issue and it's not something worth, it's not worth it to me to fight politics for, with someone and then lose the opportunity to talk to talk Jesus with them, right? Um, and so I have been so good. I have exercised very good self-control since being back on Facebook, uh, self-control being one of the fruits of the Spirit, but it does give me the opportunity to practice that self-control, right? Um, and it gives me a place to be a light. It's so important um, that we do that. So if you are someone who is sort of housebound, then I would really encourage you, find a place online to be um, a light and to minister to people. So I decided to stop at verse 16, although I did mention going through 18 um, last time I made the Matthew video, but I have a lot to say about this next portion, so I think that I'll just stop here for today. Next time we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 through the end of the chapter, so we'll basically just pick up where we left off and finish up the chapter next time. And then on our Genesis study, we are doing chapter 6 verse 13, through chapter 8 verse 19 next time. Um, so I hope you will join us for those studies. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to take this survey about um, dreams, um, I will link it in the comment section so you can take that survey about dreams and kind of help me out in the study that I'm working on. And I should be seeing that video in the next couple of weeks. Otherwise, I hope that you have a lovely weekend and I will see you all soon. Bye-bye. Right,